when she was talking about mustard seed, the small, not working anymore. And if you look in Matthew where Jesus talked about the mustard seed, but it, how do we make that grow? And I believe that what we should do, those who are grabbing onto healing, is that we need to grab those scriptures. We need to find those and we need to meditate on scriptures of healing and applying those to ourselves. That's how we're going to build that mustard seed to go beyond that tiny, and it will, because that mustard seed does grow, and it grows by hearing the word of God. Get your scriptures, read them out loud. Don't just read them. Let Read them out loud. Speak them. Declare them over yourself, and that will grow, and you will begin to see healing working. That's right. How about a yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? The more we come ready to be instructed, the more we're going to learn together, the more we'll walk it out together. And as, as one brother told me, and this has really stuck with me, what he said to me, he said, George, preach, teach, then heal. There's an order. There's an order. Because if you get healed without the preaching and the teaching, you're going to take the credit. Because the preaching and teaching, hopefully, that you receive is telling you who is about to move mightily in your life. And here's the thing. It's important for you to know who is moving mightily in your life. Because we like to talk as when it happens. Jesus already happened. The cross already happened. The blood already happened. The resurrection already happened. It has all happened. So we need to be walking in what has already happened. we got to stop crying out, saying, Lord, I need you to go die on the cross again. No, he doesn't. He finished it. Lord, I need you to resurrect again. No, you need to be resurrected. He already did it. God's changing our hearts and our minds, which uh, and then transforms our attitudes. Amen. There's an attitude that we need to talk about today that the Lord laid on my heart because as I've been thinking about what this man told me, and I was like, Lord, you've called me to preach and teach your word. I know that you're you're already moving. You said what you have begun, you're going to finish, and you what you begin is good. So what you finish is great. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord? Right? But God says there's instruction. We've been talking about this the last two weeks in this series, Who's on First? We've been talking about the importance of disobedience and the effects of, uh, or excuse me, the importance of obedience and the effects of both obedience and disobedience. I hope you've been reading the scriptures that I've given you to read. I encourage you, if you have not, to go back and to read those uh, scriptures because they will open up your eyes and ears and heart to what it means to please God. But God just doesn't want you to please him. God wants you to follow the authority he's placed over you. See, Jesus says to the disciples before he leaves the earth, all power and authority has now been given unto me. Amen. But when you look, especially at the American church today, I don't see a Jesus that has all power and authority. I see people wrestling for power and authority so they can be promoted and they can tell people what they think. That's the American church today. Oh, and if we make room for everyone to say what they think, it's just because, well, we don't want to offend. Jesus said, when you follow me, you will offend. 
He offended, but his offense led to my salvation. I'm not going to hell today. Anybody else in the room not going to hell today? Right? But can I give you a reality for America? Just for America. We can talk, we'll talk about the world later, but just in America, I just want to tell you why we're sitting in here, people are going to hell. Yes, I know it's Sunday, but don't think for one minute that people are not going, they're going to hell on Sunday. So I hope that you've come here not to be comfortable, not to get away from the world. That's why we brought Ray Miller in here so that Ray Miller could tell you that we need to be in the midst of it. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But today's message, two words, follow Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Again, get ready, stretch your fingers, lick them. We're going to go through a few scriptures today, but this pastor does not tell you what he thinks. This pastor wants to share with you what God tells me, teaches me, and shows me, and I want to share it with you this morning. John chapter 12, John chapter 12, we'll start at verse 20, John chapter 12, verse 20. Keep in mind these words throughout the message today, follow Jesus. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Now, this is a big deal because the Passover is for the Jews, not for Greeks. At this time, the Jews are still convinced that they have Jesus all to themselves and he's not for the rest of the world. Thank God for God so loved the world. Amen. And so they come and they're asking for permission. Lord, may we see Jesus. This broke my heart because I've, had, I've been in places and I've had people who've come to me and, and said, you know, Pastor, I want to thank you that, that you make yourself available to us because we go places sometimes and the pastor has an entourage. He has security. Um, you call to schedule with him, and he doesn't meet with anybody. He has all his other pastors meet with folks. And I get it. If you have a large church, it's very difficult to meet with everybody. But here's the thing. If God can love the whole world, then what's my issue? Because I'm telling you, he loves you and that he'll make room for you. Yet if you try to come to me and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I'm like, oh, no, you need to sign up over there on that list. No, Jesus didn't do that to anyone. And because he didn't do it to anyone, I'm not going to do it to you. Now, I do fail sometimes. I get busy, things happen, and I apologize to you for that. But I will let you know that if I am unavailable, I'm going to make sure that somebody who is walking and following Jesus gets with you and prays with you and spends time with you. Because I'm not the only one with the gift of the gospel. We all have the gift of the gospel. Amen? Amen. But know that God is approachable. And it says here, Philip told Andrew about it. So Philip goes to somebody else because uh, Philip is like, well, Andrew, he, he told me last night that in a meeting that he's in charge. That's what you're seeing here. The disciples even had promotion issues because you had a mom who said, hey, when my sons get to heaven, you're going to put them past these other uh, smelly people, fishermen, right? You're going to, right? Jesus says, what are you talking about? First will be last and the last will be first, right? So he goes to Andrew and they went together to ask Jesus. Now, this is funny. We're in chapter 12 already several times. People have come to Jesus, and Jesus has accepted him right away. Isn't it funny that the disciples still don't get it? You know why? Because they're not following Jesus. They're using Jesus. Today, you've got to ask yourself a question. Am I following Jesus, or am I just using his name? Am I following Jesus or just using his name? Because these two disciples, if they're truly following Jesus, would have not hesitated to take these Greeks to Jesus. But instead, 
They take, and Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. See, a seed needs to follow its plan and purpose because when it go, grows, it produces. But right now, they don't get that. They don't understand that they're supposed to be producing the kingdom of God. Right now, they are only wanting it for themselves. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Anyone in this church today want to see new lives come to Jesus Christ? The only way new lives are going to come to Jesus Christ is going to be at the hands and feet of people who follow Jesus. That's the only way it's going to happen. God is not going to give the lost over to people who still act like they're lost. He's not going to give people over to lead them if we're not following. You want who are the best leaders? The best leaders are the ones willing to show you who they follow. Those are the best leaders. Disciples haven't gotten there yet. The Church of America has lost sight of this. And it says here, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. In other words, as we talked about last week, giving up the world for eternal things, things that will last forever. God didn't promise you tomorrow, but he promised you an eternity, which doesn't need tomorrows. But you got to live for him today. You have to live for him today. And it says here, anyone who wants to be my disciple must Hear the word, must, let me say it again, must, let me say it one more time, must, so it's not a suggestion, it's not an idea, it is a command, it is an order, you must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me, and some people would say, well, geez, what is Jesus saying, that I'm only good enough to be a servant? Go to Philippians chapter 2 and you'll discover that Jesus became a servant Amen. so he could fulfill the plan of the Father. Amen. He wasn't trying to say, because I'm a servant, now you're a slave to me. No, what he is saying is, my example as a servant is what you need to follow. You need to humble yourself. Amen. Because the perfect example for us in following Jesus is a Jesus who followed God. In other words, Jesus was willing to show you who he followed. Amen? Go to 1 John, 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7. We're getting warmed up. 1 John 1, 7. Again, like I said, we're going to wrinkle your Bible. We're going to wear it out. 1 John 1, 7. And the word of God says in 1 John 1, 7, but if we are living in the light, that means if Jesus is the light and we are living in his light, we must be what? Following him, right? Amen. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. In other words, you have been given a message as people of light that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses anybody from all sin. So why aren't we telling people? Why aren't we out there telling people? We use different things like, well, pastor, if God would have called me into full-time ministry like you, you've been called to full-time ministry. Amen. I'm going to show you here in a few minutes because we're going to go to 20, Jeremiah 29.11. And when we get done with Jeremiah 29.11, you're never going to go rushing back to that just to feel good anymore. God has called all of you full time. Some he has given the gift to preach, some to teach, some to give, some to encourage, some to edify. There's a fivefold ministry that we're going to get into this summer, Brother Mark. We're going to dig into the fivefold ministry, right? Because there's not a person in this room that doesn't have a ministry. But if you say, well, pastor, if that's true, why am I not a pastor? First of all. You are a testimony. How do you defeat the enemy? By the blood of the land and the word of our testimony. 
I want to show you today that whatever it is that you were called to do, you were called to do it and not me because God was going to use you to talk to people I can't reach. We are to reach the world for Jesus Christ. He said, go ye into all the world, which means all of you better have different jobs than mine. You all better be in different places, different work schedules, because we got to reach the world for Jesus. Well, if God would just make my plan and purpose to full, serve him full time, or if he'd give me a better paying job, how about being thankful that you have a job? How about being grateful for what God has provided for you? Every night, Laura and I get down, and we thank God for everything he's given us. I even thank God for the people when we go out who prepare our food because I didn't have to prepare it. I thank God for the people who are washing dishes so that they can put food on their table, and I don't have to wash the dishes. But we have gotten so arrogant we think we're all that in a bag of chips that we walk on people who are like, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a dishwasher. Well, you must not be living for God. Well, let me just say this to you right now. Peter was a fisherman, and he is the first pastor in the world. Let me tell you, it's recorded in the Bible. Fisherman. Denies Jesus three times. Only to be forgiven. And go out and do what he was called to do. And what does Peter do as a fisherman slash apostle of Jesus Christ? He preaches a message that 3,000 people get saved. I've had pastors ask me, where did you go to college? I didn't. What do you mean you didn't go to college? I've just been in the Word of God. I've been asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. He's a great teacher. And they've come to me and said, well, what, how do you preach? What's the type of style you preach? I said, uh, I don't know, word of God. <laughs> I had someone the other day ask, they said, hey, pastor, what version are you going to use this Sunday? And I said, the holy one. <laughs> right? 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 You want the truth, get in your Bible. You want to be able to preach a message like Peter? Then you got to get in the Bible. Peter got to walk with Jesus. You want to walk with Jesus? Get in the word. Can I speak truth today? Because that's all I'm going to do today, speak truth. Listen to this. I want you to hear this closely because you may want to applaud when you hear this, but I want you to hold the applause for a minute. So there's a couple of quotes I want to share with you. The first one is, following Christ is not a casual or occasional practice, but it is a continuous commitment and way of life, his life. Now, you say amen to that, but I want to say, guess who said that? Dalen H. Oaks, one of the primary leaders in the Mormon church, said that. If you know the history and Mormons, you will find out they don't live for Jesus. They live for earthly things. They build temples. They walk in legalism. They don't follow Jesus. And I looked at this and I'm like, wow. Here's a guy who is literally leading people to hell with their teachings. And yet he comes up there and says that the key to following Christ is realizing he's the lifestyle. Well, do we really understand what it means to let Jesus be your lifestyle? Because it's not giving you more money. It's not giving you promotions. It's not making you look better. It's not letting you replace the pastor at the pulpit. It's none of those things. Following Jesus means that you no longer want to control your life. You want to let him be Lord of your life. So I love what Bob Goff said. Bob Goff is one of the gentlemen I follow who talks about how to love God and how to, how to love others. And I, and I love his teachings but he said this, Bob Goff said, our problem with following Jesus today is that we are trying to be a better version of us rather than a more accurate reflection of Christ. Amen. We just want to look good. Jesus, I want you in my life just so I can look good. But oh, by the way, when I don't need you, can you please hide in the back? Because I don't want to be embarrassed. This is a man who went to the cross for you, resurrected from the dead for you, spends 24-7 
on his royal throne, but he's not sitting on it. He's kneeling at it because he's interceding on your behalf, praying for you right now to receive the word that God asked for you today. A light shines brighter through reflection. The reason the American church light is flickering and not strong is because we are not reflecting Jesus. We are trying to reflect a better us. So what do we do, Pastor? What do we do? Well, I want to tell you some good news. God has given every one of you in this room today the abilities, the desires, and the equipment to cooperate, say it with me, cooperate wholeheartedly with his plans and his purposes for us. Jeremiah 29, 11. Here we go. Jeremiah 29, 11. Over the last six weeks, the Lord just keeps me going deeper and deeper with this passage of Scripture and the Holy Spirit has just revealed so much from this passage that we like to use because we want people to feel that they have a hope and a future, but we're not paying attention to the details in this passage. So when somebody is saying, I don't have employment, we're going, well, Jeremiah 20 and 9, 11, we'll just give you that. God has a plan and purpose for you. But what if it's a person who's unemployed Simply because they don't want to humble themselves and flip burgers, they want to be manager. Am I the only guilty one in here that has wanted to move to the top first? I don't, I, I, I would, I would do great things for God, but he didn't make me a manager. Well, let me ask you something. Have you ever flipped a burger? Well, no. Then what do you know about managing people who do? How can you manage people successfully if you've never been where they are? Jesus is the awesome manager, the best manager in the entire world. Why? Because he came where we were. So that he could feel what we feel, go through what we go through, and then tell us there's a hope and a future. So let's read this together. Matthew, or excuse me, Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And we, in our earthly minds, think this has to do with what we were called to do, like our daily job, like being a plumber or being a librarian or or working on roofs or, or digging holes or whatever it is. We look at this verse and go, so... I feel like God has called me to be a plumber. I'm not downgrading the job of plumber. But boy, if that's all you think God's plan's worth is you having a job, then you don't know God like you should. And the reason you don't know God like you should is because you don't follow the Jesus who would take you to the God who would tell you who he is and what he's up to. Can you feel the Holy Spirit beginning to speak to us this morning? As we look at this, that he has these plans, right? And so the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And he says, George, tell the church their future. Your future is not that we're going to have all this property and all these buildings and we're going to meet the needs of the community, which, oh, by the way, is going to happen when we actually walk in the future of what God has for us. But it will never happen unless we walk in the future. And so the Holy Spirit says, tell them their future is with Jesus. Your future is with Jesus. That's it. Your future is with Jesus. But let me tell you, for the world who doesn't have Jesus, you're way ahead. Because you have Jesus. But we sit here and we just play around and we're just like, well, you know, Jesus isn't on the earth anymore, so I guess it doesn't really count for much. No, the Bible says that he has been given all power and authority. You know why you disrespect the Holy Spirit? Because you disrespect the Son of God. The Holy Spirit gives you power that, oh, by the way, Jesus is distributing because he has all power and authority. God gave it to him. But we don't recognize our Jesus like that. 
We don't pray to Jesus like that. Oh, we'll pray for our food. We'll pray for a fever. But when somebody is broken on the street, will we stop and go, brother, sister, can I lay hands on you and let Jesus change your life? Well, pastor, I can't do that because I'm on my lunch break. You wouldn't have a lunch break if it weren't for Jesus. You wouldn't have a job if it weren't for Jesus. But we've left out the foundation of our lives. Jesus is our future. He's the future. So, Pastor, what's the hope? If Jesus is our future, then our hope is in our future, Jesus. That's our hope. So if that's our hope, then why aren't we telling people? Why aren't we telling people that Jesus is our hope? Because we don't have enough faith in him or trust in him to say he is our hope. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I mean, you know, you, you know I, I, I would love to give to things that are happening in the church, but you don't, you don't realize that I just don't make a whole lot of money. Hmm. But you make something. Here's my question. Is it that you don't have a whole lot of money because God is jipping you, or are you not a whole lot of money because you don't know how to handle it? We're going to get real in here because I want us to see that Jeremiah 29, 11 is not a joke, but we have been mocking it by the way that we choose to live our lives and then dare tell God he doesn't do enough for us. You'll spend money at the casino. I've had people who said, you know what, I'll go to the casino and if I make enough money, Pastor, I'll give some to the church. I don't want your casino money because your attitude sucks. I'm saying it. It's getting real. Yeah, go ahead, turn me off, but the Holy Spirit's still going to speak to you. He's greater than YouTube. Yeah. He's speaking right now for all of us. Ouchie, ouchie, ouchie. The truth of the matter is, the reason that we are not where God wants us to be is because we refuse to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. We don't want to follow everything that we are to follow. Yet Jesus did it successfully. He did exactly everything the Father said. Why? So that you could realize that you could also walk in the same way. But we look at Jesus and we're like, well, he had one up. He came from heaven. So he had deity. He gave up deity so he could be a man. He had no help from heaven. He had to call out to heaven just like everybody else did. The Bible says in the evening he would go out and pray to the Father. Why? He needed to ask for help in every way. But will we give Jesus credit for that? No. Instead, we'll just give our sob stories and just say, well, you know what? I would do more for God if he'd do more for me. He died for you. He sent his only begotten son for you. You're not going to hell if you've made him his Lord. I think that's a big enough deal. Because the rest of the world who doesn't know Jesus and made him his Lord is going to hell. And if you say, well, pastor, how bad is it? Read your Bible. You'll find out how bad hell is. There's actually a man who begs somebody in heaven to bring him water because he's in so much torment. And he's told, sorry, too late. That's how painful it is, right? So here's the thing. Let's talk about his plans first. His plans are multifaceted. What do you mean, Pastor, by multifaceted? What I mean is God's plans help you to be open to learning and new experiences. See, Being multifaceted means that your mind is now open to stop thinking about the things of this world and open it up to the kingdom of God and the supernatural power and authority of God. That's what it's for. His plans are going to make you multifaceted where you're going to realize, wow, I didn't know that I could do that. Wow, I didn't know I could say that. Wow, I didn't know I could tell the devil to go kiss my grits. Sorry, mom and dad. I was raised in the South, and that's what we told people who we got tired of. You can kiss my grits. All right? Guys, let me, let me just, ah! Holy Spirit right now just wants you to hear this. You don't overcome because you won't follow Jesus. 
You want to overcome, you need to follow Jesus because the Bible says in John 16, that he came to overcome the world. Amen. Oh, by the way, and he did it. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. So his plans are multifaceted. His purposes are multidimensional, meaning anything with many parts. Oh, wait. Doesn't my Bible say there's something about many parts? Doesn't your Bible say something about many parts? Right? You're not in your head. What has many parts? The body of Christ. Right? So the plans and the purposes of God are not about your individual lifestyle. It's about the lifestyle that you follow Jesus' example. Amen? So let me help you out here. Okay? Some of you work at the prison or the jail or you work at a grocery store or you do counseling some of you may be, be retired some of you uh, may work for the sanitation department some of you may work fast food every day when you get up and go to work somebody is going by you that doesn't know Jesus you under God's purpose and plan, are supposed to tell them. Well, no, I mean, I thought, uh, Pastor, it was your job. If you bring someone to me and say, Pastor, I was talking to him about Jesus, could you lead him to the Lord? I'm going to say no, but I'll watch you do it. Why? Because all of us have been assigned. There's not a person, believer-wise, that has not been assigned the duty to give out the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says for all of us to go out and to make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You don't have to bring them here to get baptized. You can lead them to the Lord, then take them to your house and baptize them in your bathtub. Why is it that we think the only way people can get saved is they have to go to a revival service or they have to come to church on Sunday? They are not promised tomorrow. You are not promised tomorrow. Why are you playing with their life and your life like that? Why? Because you don't follow Jesus. Because I don't follow Jesus. Look, I'm putting myself in there. I'm not just as a pastor coming and saying, you're going to get a church. No, the Lord's trying to get a hold of the church, all of us. To say, you want to see great miracles in your church? You want to see healings and wholeness happen? Then start following my son. Start following Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm looking at verses 22 through 24. 22 through 24, the Word of God says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. We look at this and we see serving them and we think, Well, I just need to make sure I do a good job at work. No, you need to make sure God is at your work. That is the good work of God, is that you bring God to your work. Well, Pastor, you don't understand my situation. You don't realize that they've already told me I can't talk about God. Then why haven't you talked about God tearing down the wall so you can start talking about God? I just find it funny that I have made these excuses to the Lord before. They say, well, God, in this situation, like God didn't realize what the situation was. He knows where places are godless. He sent you there so that you would bring him. Well, you know what, Pastor? You don't understand. They'll fire me. And, 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 and so let me just let go back to, to uh, Mishael, Azariah, right? Right? We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Can, can we go back to them? Hmm. They got into a fire, a really hot, hot fire. And I don't read about them dying in the fire. What I read about is somebody showed up and joined them in the fire. You know why, why godless places stay godless? Because godly people won't follow Jesus. 
oh, pastor, how dare you say that? I'm saying it because God convicted me as a pastor to say, tell your church about Jesus. Teach them to follow Jesus. I appreciate, George, that for the last four years you've worked really hard to preach good sermons, but I don't need you to preach them good sermons. I need you to tell them about me, teach them about me, prepare them to go out and tell other people about me. Your pastor's been changed. I'm bringing the truth. I want you to know God. I want you to know his son, Jesus. I want you to know the Holy Spirit. I want you to know fivefold ministry. I want us to walk in it. I want to see this valley rejoicing because we're bringing in the sheaves. But if you think for one minute that sheaves and the production of sheaves depends on how well I preach on Sunday, you got another thing coming. Because even if I preach one of my worst messages, God is still greater than my worst. And he will still uphold you to what he is commanding you and I to do. I don't come up here anymore to impress you. I come here to honor him. I'm going to do what he's asked me to do. Whatever you decide to do with it, it's up to you, church. If you want to stay lifeless and flexless and all of that, fine. But I'm not staying there. I'm not staying there. God wants more, and he wants more souls for Jesus. And we're going to go for souls for Jesus. And we're going to equip you, and we're going to get you ready. We are preparing for that. We want to have classes where you can go, but these classes aren't to make you feel better. These classes are to help you get ready so you can go. A lot for us to take in this morning. I realize that, but the Lord knows. Amen. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I got a few more scriptures, but I'm just going to go to one more after this, and then I'll give you the rest of the scriptures. But I want you to know that this message didn't come from Pastor Googling. This came from Pastor Seeking God and saying, give me truth to give to you today. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 6, 6 through 11. Proverbs chapter 6, 6 through 11. It says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, yet they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? And when will you finally wake up? A little extra sleep, a little bit more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Your poverty is not based on God holding out. Your poverty is you holding out on God. Because he is not going to bless those who are disobedient. And oh, by the way, if you're lazy, you're being disobedient. If you're not sharing God in your workplace, you're being disobedient. Husbands, if you're not leading your families every day with the word of God, spending time in prayer and devotions, you're being disobedient. Don't expect God to come in with his blessings for your family when you won't even take the time to recognize the one who blesses. We need change. We need change. The American church doesn't need new government. The American church doesn't need a new plan. What the American government needs is Jesus. What the American population needs is Jesus. What the American church needs is Jesus. What we need here today is Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. If not, this is what we have to look towards. But we have an ant, an ant, and you've seen ants. They carry things, they say, over 500 times their body weight. And yet we're just like, oh, <laughs> did you hear what Pastor said? We're going to have to set up tables after the service. I don't feel able today. Well, you just came up and said you believe you've been healed. So as far as I'm concerned, every man in this room today is able just saying. And if men, you are able, then women, you are able. Why? Because your God is able. Right? Let me show you what I mean as we get ready to close. Matthew 14. Matthew 14. 
amazing story that I've read over and over. I've preached messages on. And i got to tell you, I thank God that I have preached messages. And when I go back and look and say, God, how did you even let me preach a message on this passage when I was so clueless? And God is like, because even in your cluelessness, I'm still great. And so I have literally, I, I just want to testify. I want to give glory to God. I want to be transparent with you. I have watched messages over the last 15 years that I've done and I'm literally gone, oh my gosh. And yet God will send someone who will come to me and say, hey, Pastor, you remember that message you preached seven years ago? And they tell me, and I'm like, uh oh, they're finally going to let me have it. And they're like, wow, the Spirit of God just spoke to me. And then God comes to me and says, George, in your folly, I can still use the Holy Spirit. That's why I can't wait to teach you on the Holy Spirit. Fourth, uh, Mark, I'm telling you, Fourth of July Sunday is going to be like nothing we've ever had before. But we're going to take our time. We're going to really take time to teach you about the Holy Spirit. Because the thing that God's going to do takes the Holy Spirit. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. But it's getting back to the root. It's getting back to the word of God. Right. So I want to take you back to the story. And it has just impacted me. I got to share this with just so you know, I shared it with my family first. I shared it with my wife first. And they all said it blessed them. So I'm like, OK, good. I'll preach it. Right. No, 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 no. I'm preaching it because God said to preach it. It said immediately, verse 22, immediately after this, Jesus has just fed over 10,000 people. Five loaves, two fish. You remember that story? Right? He's just got done feeding them. It's been an all-day ordeal. It is now nighttime. And I love this. As I read it, it said immediately after they got finished, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat, cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. I love this because Jesus knows when you've had enough. He knows. And so he doesn't want you serving people or dismissing people in your own strength. He's going to do it in his strength. Man, this just blew me away because he's sending them off. He's like, you need to go. I already know you were having issues. You didn't even want to feed them. Now you have fed him, and now I feel it. You're just kind of like feeling jaded. Oh, Jesus, you spent all the time with all these people. You were spent time with me. And Jesus like, I can't deal with this right now. You get in a boat, and can you leave, please? Because I'm not going to let your attitude affect the masses. In other words, God wants you to know if you're not going to follow Jesus, he's not going to allow you to affect the people who don't know him. This is how important it is for us to understand why we need to follow Jesus. And so, anyway, he sends them off, right? And after sending the people home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, and night fell while he was there alone. Now, I'm going to come back to this in just a minute, because Jesus had a plan and a purpose, a strategy in his prayer that night, and I had missed it. Remember when I said, what is he doing for us 24-7? He is literally at his throne on his knees interceding for us to the Father sitting on his throne. He doesn't have to do that. But he chooses to use his authority and power to get on his knees and say, God, you gave me authority and power, so I'm praying right now for City Reach Church and all the people there today that they will claim their healing and that they will rededicate and commit to following you, Lord. And it says in here, he went up to pray. And there's a reason why. We'll see it here in a minute. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land. Hello, doesn't that sound like some of our stories? We walk away from church, and it seems like as soon as we get in the parking lot, trouble just... Poof. Let me tell you why trouble attacks people in the parking lot of the church when you get out of church. Because you brought it with you and left it in the car. Can we be real? If you bring trouble and let it sit in your back seat of the car before you come into the house of God, it will pound on you when you get back in the car. So get rid of the trouble. Resist it. Tell it, out of my car. You don't belong here. In other words, if you need men to apologize to your wife for being stupid, then apologize for being stupid. Wise, if you need to apologize to your husbands because you argued over something that wasn't worth arguing about, then humble yourself and apologize. Get it right. Oh, by the way, children, you're in church. 
I get to talk to you too because children need to follow Jesus. If you were yelling and screaming in the car, talking back to your mommy and daddy, if you were disrespecting them before you get into church, you need to apologize and make it right. See, there's a reason why the church, the, the children in the church today, they need to hear the same word. It applies to them too. We all need to be following Jesus. Amen. Right? But we cut the children short while well, they're just kids. Mm-mm. They're creations of God. They need to know that God loves them and that God wants to use them. Only a boy named David, only what? A rippling brook. Only a boy named David and five little stones he took, right? Only a boy named David. La, 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 right? <laughs> right? Right? Here's the thing that I love. Here's the thing that I love. I got, I got to share this with you. I'm trying to get us through because I know we're hungry and we want to get to food. But, guys, I, got to, this, I heard this last night. It just cracked me up. So they said, David, when David first went to the brook and picked up the five stones, he said, wait a minute, God. Don't you realize how big the giant is? Until he stood up obediently and turned toward the giant and realized, I can't miss. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Haven't we been that way? We're just like, oh, God, this is what you gave me to go. And God's going, look, you can't miss. Can we get a hallelujah in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Right? Oh, I loved that last night. I was just like laughing and taking that in because I'm like, God, make sure you can't miss. But he also, hear this, he also ensures that the enemy will. The enemy's going to miss. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Can you hear yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on. Right? So, and that was free, by the way. That was free. All right, so here we go. So they were in trouble far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw someone walking on the water, they were terrified, and in their fear they cried out, It's a ghost! It was. It was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> right? Because here's the thing, church, you need to know this. When the wind and the waves get stirred up, this is what I love. The enemy wasn't in the process of creation. When it came to the water and the wind, it was the Holy Spirit. Amen. He was put in charge. Right? So I just want to say this to you right now. The devil can come and he can stick his hand in your water and stir it. But he doesn't control it. He's not the power of it. Mark, you get water to your field. Right? But someone else, master controls when the water comes to you. Correct? Right? You're dependent on the master. Don't focus on the one stirring the Kool-Aid with their bare hand. Don't worry about it. Kool-Aid's still good. All right? You'll be all right. Immunities, immunity, immunities. Right? But the real master of the wind and the waves was the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, how do we know this? Because Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? He's already filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus spoke to them once. Don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. Then Peter, there he is. Hello, Peter. Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter went over to the side of the boat, and he walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Immediately Jesus reached out, grabbed him, and said, You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Then they climbed back into the boat, and the wind stopped. And the disciples worshipped him. Really, we now know you are the Son of God. We just got a word today that just spoke to that. O oh, you of little faith. O oh, you of the mustard seed of faith. Let's not hang out with mustard seeds. Let's go bigger. Right? Betty, I spoke over you one day. When you first came here, we said you're going to take a mountain. But not too long ago, God spoke to you and said, now I'm going to give you mountain ranges. He doesn't want you to just settle for a mountain. He wants you to take it all. Right? He wants to give you all because he's always given us all. Amen. 
right? But I want you to notice something in this story. This is the point, guys, I want to make in our closing this morning. When Peter said, if it's you, Lord, then let me walk on water. Let me come to you. Peter was not following Jesus. Peter just wanted to include Jesus. He was still going to take credit if he got to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, guys, did you see what I did? See, because Peter still has an issue with the other 11 disciples because he thinks they got issues and he doesn't have any. And so there he is. He's saying, pick me, Jesus, I'll walk the water. And Jesus said, come to me, come to me, come to me. The reason you come to Jesus isn't to include him in your life. It's to follow him forever and give him your life. So I want you to see this. Peter, right now not following Jesus, he just wants to include Jesus. And so what happens? He begins to sink because he sees the wind and the waves and he begins to cry out. And that made me realize something. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. So he had no idea without the Holy Spirit. He didn't know that the Holy Spirit was controlling the wind and the waves. He had no idea. So he's crying out to Jesus and Jesus picks him up and says, oh, you little faith. You, are, you don't even know. You don't know who I am. You don't want to follow me. And because you don't want to follow me, you don't understand the power that is in me. But I love what happens. The Bible says that after he picks up Peter, did they walk across the sea to the other side and show off to the other disciples who didn't get out of the boat? No, what does the Bible say happened? Jesus took him back to the boat. In other words, what I'm saying is, Jesus, if you're not following him, he is not going to lead you to the top of the mountain right away. He's going to take you back to the bottom so you can follow him to the top. He brought Peter back to the boat. Peter's going, wait, 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 what are we doing? We're going back to the boat. And Jesus is like, because that's where I want to be, because that's where the other 11 guys are, and they need me too. You feel the Holy Spirit speaking to us today. Following Jesus. Following Jesus. I love what Dr. Charles Stanley said. I praise God that he is in heaven today. And he's rejoicing with his King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he said something that I really loved. He said this. He said, we think that Jesus should just be included in our lives. But he said, Jesus was not created for inclusion. Listen to this. Jesus was not created for inclusion He was created for habitation. He's not to be included in your life. He is to inhabit your life. Meaning he needs to be in control of your life. Write these scriptures down. We're not going to go there, but I want to encourage you to go there. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 11. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 11. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 11. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 34 through 37, Psalm 119, 34 through 37, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. I encourage you, go deeper this week with this message. Go deeper. Read these scriptures. Go back and read the scriptures that we've already read together. Paul Washer said this. If following Jesus doesn't cost you anything, it's because you've bought into American Christianity, not Jesus Christ. Can I say that one more time? If following Jesus doesn't cost you anything... It's because you've bought into American Christianity, not Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads for a moment, please? We're getting a call from the Spirit of the Lord today. And that call is simply this. Will you decide to follow Jesus today? Will you follow him in the way that he wants you to follow him, which means that no longer are you going to question how he leads, but you are going to praise him because he leads. 
You're going to let him be in control. You're going to be the one that you say, you don't owe me an explanation, but I owe you, as the song says, everything. Church, are you willing to follow him? Kevin, if you start the music, simple.